Hey, Marvin, how are you? Hello, teacher. How was your day? Oh, this day was a very great day because uh, with my partner, we went to uh, make climbing mountain. Mountain climbing, oh, yeah. where did you go? Uh, here in my town in Candelaria, La Frontera. Okay. Yeah, we have a lot of mountain around here. And after the meeting, we I invite to my friends and we go to, to uh, it's maybe not climbing, it's more make hiking. Is like hiking? Yes, like hiking. Ah, uh -huh, okay. Yeah. And how long is the how long is the hike? An hour, two hours? Oh, uh, it's like a two hours. Mm, a little long. It's not. It's not so small. No, no. It's a kind of it's, it's uh, long and it's a kind of uh, very hard way because it's very um, I don't know up. Ah, uh, inclined. Mm -hmm. Inclined. Yes, it's very kind of hard. Mm. But mm -hmm. but it, but in my case, I do that. I do that uh, almost uh, every day. One day yes, one day not. I, that is my routine. Oh wow! You so you go hiking a lot? Yes, uh, uh, yes. Maybe three or four days a week. Oh, you are yeah. very healthy then. Uh, I think, but I don't know. <laughs> I'm doing that uh, since. Uh, uh, 2012 maybe like 10 years then I, I think yes because it's it's very healthy to go climbing three or four times a week is a lot a lot of walking yeah, yes it's very it's very uh, uh, satisfying because in the body you feel uh, the, the healthy but also in the mind you feel very well because when I go to make that routine, mm -hmm. I sit down, top on the mountain, and I I spend time thinking about life. I, I spend time uh, meditating in life. Mm -hmm. And I think that I feel a kind of peace in my mind. And I, I think it's good for my body and it's good for my mind. Wow, very nice. It's, yeah. It sounds like a very a very relaxing hike and you enjoyed nature. Mm -hmm. Yes, teacher, it's very nice for me. I enjoy that. That's why I decide to make that routine because I really love to do that. And you always go with the same friends or by yourself? Uh, uh, always by myself alone okay yes just this day i invite my uh they are my uh, my partners uh my colleagues mm -hmm. and they decide to go with me and they they comment that they enjoy the trip um, but it's not normal for them no it's not normal for them it was very hard because they were <laughs> I kind of exhaust because they they are not uh, they don't practice that or they was very hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you don't practice, elf is difficult. It's difficult if it's not normal for you to walk. Yes, it's hard during mm -hmm. the pandemic when it was uh, the quarantine. Mm -hmm. I. I cannot do that, and, and I uh, I lose the 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 ability, the speed to to uh, do that. And when I start again, it was hard for me. Uh, I, it's it's typical because uh, when you don't do exercise or other activities, 
and you want to begin again, it's like, ah, oh, the body yeah. is, no, no, no. I don't want to work. I don't want to work. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. That happened in that, in that time. But um, I really, because I really enjoy it. I love it. I, it's easy for me to continue uh, uh, doing the routine. Okay. Good. That's good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, hey, Alex, you. Miguel, how are you guys? Good. Very good. But you know, what teacher, teacher? I, I have a problem with that. Try, when I try to uh, the class, because I uh, appear, uh, hey, please, it's necessary to register. Register. Okay. Uh -huh. I try. I register. And then I go to the, uh, send me an a email. And mm -hmm. when I, I check my email, uh, I, I can't. Uh, enter to the uh, class, but I don't know why. It's the first time they approved this. They asked me about the re register, but okay. I think maybe that when when Zoom has updates, then they have this situation. Uh, because it depend okay. on the updates for the for Zoom. Uh, yeah, okay. Yes, yes, teacher. This time was different for me. Also, I tried to get the class, and I was uh, very different. Uh, step to get in maybe yeah. that's why the others cannot enter yet i i saw in the chat in the chat uh, i think two or three people i report that is a a storm that is raining yeah. very hard oh. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because i maybe saw a, a, a store mm -hmm. or like a maybe or, or maybe like, like a storm. <laughs> no, no storm. It's, it's, it's not, not, not a storm. storm. No, yeah, <laughs> no storm. Exactly. Uh -huh. Yes, but I imagine they're going to connect a little bit later. Always is a little problem when there are updates with with mm -hmm. Zoom. The Zoom, how always you need a moment to do things different, put the code or register again, something like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we are going to go ahead and get started. I think um, maybe only the three of you, maybe we have the others connect later. I don't know, but we continue. Okay. okay. All okay. right. Good time for us. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Today, we're going to be looking at the fourth part, the last part of the listening. This listening is connect connecting content questions. We're going to watch the video and then practice connecting content questions. Okay. Finally, on this course, we'll take a look at listening connecting content questions. Listening connecting content questions ask you to show understanding of the relationship among ideas in a lecture. Connecting content questions may require you to fill in a chart or table. Or they may ask things like, what is the likely outcome? These type of questions will ask you to put together information from different sentences or different parts of the conversation or lecture. You may be asked to identify things like steps in a process or cause-effect relationships. Or you may be asked to classify items in categories or make a prediction, connecting content questions, steps in a process, cause and effect classification, make a prediction. Now let's look at a sample connecting content question. Okay, who is going to read? We need one to be the man, one to be the woman. And a man. Okay. I am the other, just the other. Just the other, <laughs> just the other, other. <laughs> exactly, just the other. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Why hasn't Franco yet? He told me he'd be here first thing in the morning. I'm sorry. Didn't I tell you he called and say he couldn't make, make it until this afternoon? No, you didn't. What time did he say he'd be here? About four o'clock. Four o'clock. That means we'll be working on this report until midnight. midnight. Okay. You read in here, what did Frank tell the woman about getting together to work on the report? Choose two answers. Here is more difficult, not only one or two. What did Frank mm -hmm. tell the woman? Mm -hmm. What did Frank? 
Okay. What what time did he say be here? Four o'clock. Ah uh, no no no. He he tell you call it and say couldn't make it. Okay. Because, make because it. Ram tell woman told him woman. It's That's Ram. right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what else? Afternoon? <laughs> no, no, no. Yes, Maybe yes, yes, it's correct. Because Frank did not say that he was going to stay until midnight. The man, the man says, I ah, we're going to be to midnight. But Frank, no. Frank only says, I cannot come in the morning. I will be in at four o'clock. Or mm -hmm. that he will be in in the afternoon. Those are mm -hmm. the things that the man said. Mm -hmm. so the correct answers would be letter B and letter uh -huh. B. C. He, he cannot go in the morning and he will go in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Here's a tip to help you connect ideas when you listen. When you listen to recorded material for the first time, stop the recording at various points and try to summarize what has been said. Then predict what will be said next. Mm -hmm. Okay. So always try to summarize, try to make ideas, try to make predictions. Today we're going to practice doing these different things. We're going to see how it works. Okay. So here, mm -hmm. the connecting content questions in our section two, we're going to go to the listening right here. Connecting okay. content questions. We have several different conversations that we're going to listen for and we're going to try to connect all of this information okay okay so we have four different answers that we need to go through the first is we're going to try reading the questions because this is always the most important to read the mm -hmm. questions before we listen this is the idea that helps us so when we are listening is better so me marvin number one alex number two Begin number three and Marvin number four. Okay. Read the answers. Read the question and the answers. Okay. What can we say about fish rubiks? Letter A, the art was practiced in various cultures. Letter B, the prints were slime. C, it is an ancient art. D, it is a dying art. We're going to have to select two. Remember, two of these you're going to select. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, number two. What is true about Mughal Emperor Jahangir? He was from Baghdad. He did no follow minting tradition. He used a coin in the Caliph name. He encouraged many people to flourish. No, to flourish. No, no, to flourish. To flourish is okay, correct. Okay, to flourish. Okay. Mm -hmm. The I and the H is incorrect, but uh -huh, to flourish. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then letter three. Yes. How is metallurgical mi microscope different from an optical microscope? Letter A. It can measure three dimensional objects. Letter B. It's allowed for examination of unwieldy samples, letter C. It is more delicate, letter D. It has inadequate illuminating systems. Okay. And number four. Number four. What is true about communication disorders? A. A problem with speech or hearing mechanisms is often caused by communication disorders. Letter B, communication disorders can result from emotional or psychological problems. C, the speech pathologics can help people with communication disorders improve their ability to communicate. D, communication, communication disorders frequently result from the normal function of the brain. Okay, so only from reading the questions, you can see that the questions are going to have a lot of technical information, a lot mm -hmm. of a high vocabulary. 
this is where you have to pay attention to try to identify these words. Try to mm -hmm. listen in there so that you can make it easier to, ah, this number one is A, and then, or number one is D, and then you try to match with the other ideas, okay? okay. Remember, the important is you need to select two for each question, two for each question. Okay. okay. One. You didn't come to art class yesterday, did you? Uh-uh. I got out of my chemistry lab late. Anything important I missed? Yeah. Dr. Matthews has arranged for us to meet at the art museum next week. Um, next Tuesday. I think that's the 26th. Because the museum's got a special exhibition on fish rubbings. Fish rubbings? Uh, what's that? Not a hands-on exhibition, I hope. No. Well, uh, not exactly. You missed a good lecture, though. Fish rubbings. It's an ancient art form in which fish are used to make prints. Sounds slimy. Where was this practiced? Um, in the Far East and by some native peoples in America. Will Dr. Matthews expect us to make some of our own fish rubbings afterwards? I suppose that's up to you. I think it might be interesting to give it a try. What can be said about fish rubbings? Mm -hmm. What do you select? What do you think? Let us see. Do you agree? Let, let us see is clear. Let us see is clear, but the other letter. Uh huh. So <laughs> we the option number one or the option number four. That is the technique. Yeah, because it is a dying art. Because you have two, you have two letter Cs. So mm -hmm. you see that number two, no, and number three, no, because no letter C, right? Yes. Okay, so now it's easy because now you only have to have 50% chance. You have mm -hmm. a better opportunity to get the correct. What yes. is correct, letter A or letter D? Oh, letter, letter, letter D. A. No, Lara D, it is a dying art. Okay, Miguel, what do you think? Make the decision, Miguel. Marvin says A, and I like say D. Miguel, you have to make the decision. <laughs> is it letter D? Letter D, okay. Letter D. Woo! It's beginning to rain very hard. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes, yes. Here, yes. here, yes, here too. Okay, let's see. Two. The world's heaviest gold coin is worth millions of dollars. It was minted in the year 1613 in India. The name of its issuer, Mughal Emperor Jehangir, his name is stamped on the coin. Prior to the reign of this emperor, prior to his reign, rulers in India had to obtain permission to mint coins from the caliph, the ruler in Baghdad, okay? However, Emperor Jehangir changed this tradition, okay? He um, started his own policy of issuing coins, coins in his own name. It was during the time of the Mughal dynasty that many art forms were encouraged to flourish. Emperor Jehangir supported the arts. Therefore, it's not surprising that the art of minting coins began and um, reached its peak of perfection during his reign. What is true about Mughal Emperor Jahangir? Which one? Which ones? C and D. The C is, is true. One moment. Okay. What do you think? C and D. B and D. No, no, C, C and D. C, C and D. Letter C. Yes? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. It's not correct, but I explain later. It's okay. It's okay. 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 No problem. Three. When microscopes are referred to, most people think of optical microscopes. 
these instruments were developed Do you listen? No, right? No, no. Okay. No, DJ. Let me try again. One. Arjun, awkwardly. Drain. What is true about Mughal Emperor Jahangir? Three. When microscopes are referred to, most people think of optical microscopes. These instruments were developed principally to meet the needs of the biological sciences. They aren't that useful for metallurgists. They, uh, metallurgists have large and awkwardly shaped specimens. So those who need to examine metal objects or metal structures use a metallurgical microscope. This is a special, uh, the observing and illuminating systems of a metallurgical microscope are mounted in a way that allows adjustment for accommodating odd-shaped samples. Metallurgical microscopes are equipped with devices that provide the capacity to measure an object in the X, Y, and Z axes. These microscopes are frequently used in the field instead of in the laboratory, so they must be, must be more durable. How is a metallurgical microscope different from an optical microscope? Okay. In, in letter B says, it's allowed for examination for wider samples. So letter B. Letter B. It, okay. It is, so uh, we have... Two options with yes. B. Two B options. B and C. Uh huh. It can be should three dimensional object. I don't remember the three dimensional object. And you, Marvin? Uh, Miguel? For me, maybe uh, a letter A. Yep. Letter A. Letter B A. And a. a. Okay, B and A. Okay, okay. Let's go. The last one, number four. Four. Since people communicate mostly through speech, you can imagine that a defect in speaking or hearing abilities can be an enormous handicap, right? Okay, there are three conditions in which communication disorders can result. Any ideas what these may be? Three conditions. Yes? Well, the obvious condition, I think, would be a physical one. Let's say, like, if someone's eardrum has been damaged because of an illness or an injury, that person might not be able to hear. And um, being deaf or partially deaf not only affects the person's ability to hear, but also deaf people's speech sometimes isn't all that clear, so that makes it difficult for others to understand them. You bet. If something goes wrong with the speech or hearing mechanisms, communication disorders can result. Uh, Sue? Well, I have a cousin who suffered brain damage in an accident, and he can't speak very well. And some people are just born with uh, something wrong. Yes, that's a condition we would classify. We classify it under the condition of abnormal functioning of the brain. Besides accidents, people may be born with this condition, or it can occur as a result of a stroke or a tumor. And the third condition, anybody? Well, some people have been uh, badly shocked. Uh traumatized and they get kind of emotionally upset you know I read about a boy who just stopped talking after he saw this really terrible accident good point yes an unusual emotional or psychological problem can cause communication disorders okay so communication disorders can result from um, one something going wrong with the speech or hearing mechanisms uh, two abnormal functioning of the brain, and finally, an unusual emotional or psychological problem. Now, fortunately, most communication disorders can be improved to, to some degree with the help of a speech pathologist. 
What is true about communication disorders? Okay. What about number four? What is your decision? A, B, and D. B and D. Very a, fast. B, okay. Jess, you agree? Yes, uh, B and D. Okay. Really? The, All right. The, the letter C, never. Okay, okay. Submit, it's submit. B <laughs> and C. B uh -huh. and hey. C. Ah, Alex, I see, I see. Yes. Now, here is correct. A and B. A and B. Here is B and D. And D. Oh. Here, mm -hmm. Not okay. in the caliph's name. Letter C, no. They say he he didn't issue in the caliph's name. Uh and number one is A and C. And C. You are correct with C, but not with D. It's A and C. Ah, uh, it's that it. Uh -huh. Miguel. Uh -huh. Miguel Tolos. Hey, Miguel. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. No problem. But the important is the technique. That you see, almost always, you can identify one. The important is, to try to get both of them. If you identify one, you can eliminate the others and have a better opportunity, okay? As you can see here is, you have to pay more attention because it's more information and is not only one answer, it's mm -hmm. two answers. Sometimes they have a little chart and you have to complete the chart with the information. And this also is another activity that you need to be careful with. Okay. It's okay connecting content questions? Yes, yes, it's okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, okay, good. G give me a, a few minutes, I go for my headphones. Okay, Alex, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, here in the listening practice, you see we have test number two. Test number two has many different questions and sections. You have many different listenings. We are going to listen for it and then answer the seven questions. How is the volume? Is the volume okay? You can listen or no? Yeah, it's okay. It's okay, teacher. Okay, me too. Yeah. Because if my house is raining. Repeat, Alex. In my house is raining right now. Yeah, in my house too. It's raining yes. very, very hard. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Let's try. Oh, wait, let me see. Maybe, maybe I can connect, but you can hear me okay or no, no problem? Yes, it's okay. Ah, okay. It's okay. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. Let's listen and answer the questions. Okay, so uh, do you want to review that legal terminology that Dr. Bryant went over in class? Okay, yeah, but uh, I was going to meet my roommate at the Union. We planned to jog around campus for some exercise. You can come along too if you feel up to it. Great, thanks. I'd like that. But shouldn't we review the terms first? Okay, we've got a few minutes, I guess. So what was the first one? Uh, it's burden of proof. What do you remember about that? Okay, well, this one has to do with the fact that in law cases, every person is presumed to be innocent until they're proven guilty, right? Well, yeah, but what else? What's the important thing? And, and, uh, it means that the party that brings the case, that's the plaintiff, has to prove the allegations in order to win the case, okay? Okay, and the defendant that's the person who's being accused, has the right, or the opportunity, to disprove the accusation. That is, the defendant can show, or try to show, that the accusation is false, and that the evidence used against him or her is weak. So, that means that the burden of proof is always, uh, always rests on the party, the, the person making the accusation, because the defendant is presumed innocent, and so has to be proven guilty. So, in a criminal case, 
it's up to the prosecutor to convince the judge or the jury that the allegations are true. The burden of proof rests with him or her. The prosecutor, that's the government lawyer, right? Uh, usually, but as far as I can remember, anyone can act as a prosecutor. Uh, except, uh, except in certain types of cases. Anyway, what was the next term you wanted to review? Well, uh, what exactly is meant by circumstantial evidence? Okay, circumstantial evidence. Let me think. Yeah, well, that's like indirect evidence. Yeah, okay. So it kind of implies someone could have been involved in a crime. It's not, um, it's not, it doesn't in itself directly prove who did it. So what about evidence from a witness who says they heard or saw a person commit the crime? No, that's not circumstantial. That's called direct evidence. It has to be more indirect than that. Just about everything that is not direct is called circumstantial. Remember Dr. Bryant gave an example? What was it now? Yeah, okay. He gave a couple of examples. One was, um, suppose a man earns a certain known salary and then makes some big purchases way beyond what someone on his salary could afford. He, he might buy a luxury yacht or a new beachfront apartment or something. And this happens around the time he is alleged to have stolen a large sum of money. This is not direct proof, but it is circumstantial. It would help build a case against him. Right. And it could be used in a court of law, right? Yeah, right. Unless the connection is really weak. Didn't Dr. Bryant say that, in fact, most convictions in court are based on circumstantial evidence? Yeah, I remember him saying that. Most people have the opposite idea, maybe from watching too many TV dramas. But in real life, circumstantial evidence is considered very persuasive. A strong circumstantial case is often better than an eyewitness description. Whew, a lot of information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot about circumstantial evidence. But what do they try to say? This is what can be inferred. What are they trying to say about the circumstantial evidence? Is it is without direct evidence, it is unreliable. Okay. Letter D. Letter D. Yes, we agree. Yes. Uh, agree. For me, it's letter A. For you, letter A. Yes. Okay. Okay, don't worry. We're going to check after. We want to see the different answers for everybody. Okay. So, okay. Uh, Myron, letter A, right? Yes, letter A. Alex and Miguel, letter D. Yes. Or no? Yes, yes. Yes. yes, okay, okay, all right. So two for D, one for A. Hmm. Yeah. We're going to see, we're going to see. <laughs> okay, here we have to practice today's activity. Choose two answers. Listen carefully, you have a lot, a lot of options. It's letter A, letter B, letter C, letter D, letter A and B, letter A and C, letter A and D, letter B and C, huh? Listen carefully a lot. Remember, when you are listening, read the questions, read the information so that you get a better idea. Listen to part of a lecture in an architecture class. So, now I'd like to focus on the Prairie School of Architecture, which developed the most significant architectural style in North America in the first decades of the 20th century. The main influences on this style came from several places. For example, the philosophy and practice of the architect Louis Sullivan. Now you may remember that Sullivan liked to say that form follows function. In other words, the shape and structure of a building should follow, should, should depend on the purpose, the intended use of the building. There was also the English arts and crafts movement. That was important around this time too. That was a second important influence. And 
I should mention traditional Oriental themes, which also played an important part in the Prairie School ideas. Now, the students and followers of Sullivan, the most famous of whom was Frank Lloyd Wright, developed these themes and ideas into a truly American style, a style expressing a belief in the unity of mankind and nature. Now, when people think of architecture, they, they often think of large public buildings. But most of the effort of the Prairie School was devoted to domestic buildings, mainly houses for well-to-do private citizens. So, can anyone here describe to me any of the important features of Prairie School houses? Didn't they mostly have long horizontal lines rather than a vertical appearance? Yes, yes, they did. That's certainly part of it. We can say that the most visible external features of this architecture were horizontal lines and heavy roofs projecting away from the walls. The shapes were designed to both harmonize with and reflect the broad, flat prairies of the Midwestern United States. But somewhat ironically, I suppose, most of these houses were actually built in more urban areas, especially in the Chicago suburbs, rather than on the prairies themselves. Okay, now, what about the insides, the interiors? Didn't they want to do away with small rooms? Well, in a sense, yes. Um, there was certainly an emphasis on keeping the number of separate rooms to a minimum, um, opening up living space, and uh, designing internal walls so that the light and view created a sense of unity. The idea was to reduce the number of interior corners typical of traditional European houses. See, Prairie School architects thought of this of this traditional home as confining, both physically and, and also spiritually. So, by ridding the inside of houses of, of so many rooms and corners and walls, they hoped to create a feeling of, of movement and freedom. Their ideal of beauty was to try to make the living space more compatible with human proportions and living requirements. Often, large fireplaces were built at the center of the overall design rather than attached to an outside wall. And this gave additional structural support to the building, so it further allowed the building to get by with fewer interior walls. Now, let me add that in line with their belief in the importance of nature, these architects related the interiors to the surrounding natural landscape by their use of windows that were continuous ribbons of glass. So, in that way, the outside and inside of the houses were more closely related. Other ways they suggested the importance of nature were in designing terraces projecting from the external walls with parapets, walls that were used as, as planting boxes for flowers and shrubs, and deep roof overhangs that led the eye toward the horizon. Of course, not all prairie school houses had all these features, but certainly we can say that there was a general tendency among these architects to provide their designs with many of them. Okay, so now we've discussed overall structure. Now what about ornamentation? Uh, didn't they reject almost all decorative elements? Well, not entirely. Although it's true they like to keep things simple. Again, this was in line with their opposition to what they perceived as, as the fussiness of more traditional housing styles. We can say that ornamentation was only permitted if it, if it complemented, if it, if it blended in with the overall expression and feeling of the building. So, to this end, the Prairie School architects tended to use simple, unmixed, natural materials, sometimes with geometric or oriental designs. For example, many of the prairie houses had a turned-up roof edge, reminiscent of traditional Japanese houses. Okay, so finally, I'd like to mention that these architects usually designed all the furniture that went with each house. Each piece of furniture, whether built-in or freestanding, 
was carefully crafted to fit in with the overall feeling of the house. Again, natural materials were preferred and restful horizontal lines were emphasized. Ooh, a lot of information, but you need to make a selection of two. Which two do they say about the Prairie School of Architecture? C C A D. So A A A and C A and C A and C yes A A uh, A let me see A and C but letter B no A and D let, let me see A and C A and C okay A and C. All right. And why does the professor mention traditional Japanese houses? Ah, uh, let me see. Uh, letter B. D. Alex, letter D. Letter D. Miguel, Marvin, what do you think? Remember, uh -huh. remember, practice taking notes. That way, when you listen, it's a lot of information. It's very long. You have to be careful. Marvin, what do you think? What do you think, Marvin? Uh, I, I'm agree with, with letter D. With letter D. Okay. All right. Here we go. Okay. Now we listen another one about the campus police. Only one question, number four. Okay. Yes, how can I help you? Yeah, uh, I think my car has been stolen. Okay, can you give me the details? Yeah, uh, it's a 1999 four-wheel drive blue Subaru. Okay, and when and where did you last see it? Well, this morning I parked it in front of Lacey Hall. Let me check our records. Ah, it appears your car was in a faculty-only zone. Yeah, I know. But the handicapped parking spaces were all taken, and I had to find a place so I could get easy access to my classes. Uh-huh. But since you don't have a faculty parking sticker, your car was towed. I was hoping that because I had a handicap sticker, it would be okay. There may have been a complaint from a faculty member. Well, sometimes that happens when a professor can't get to work on time because someone who isn't faculty is parked in faculty parking. So the tow truck was called. Okay. Um, how do I get my car back? Well, when a vehicle has to be towed, the owner must pay for the towing and storage fees before the car can be taken. And I'm sorry to say, there's also a parking fine. And how much will all that be? Um... The towing fee is $90, and there's a storage fee of $10 per day. So it'd be a good idea to pick up your car today, if possible. The parking fine is $50, but if you pay within seven days, the fine is reduced to $20. I think, well, all this is very unfair. If the university is going to charge so much, they should have more spaces. My car gets towed because the handicapped parking spaces are full. One of the cars didn't even have a handicapped sticker. Uh, well, you know, don't you, that you do have the right to appeal. Since you believe that circumstances exist that may excuse you from certain university regulations. Oh, so how do I go about doing that? Well, first, you write a letter of appeal. Well, that can be done online. You can go to the University Traffic Regulations page. You know the university homepage? Uh-huh. Okay. Um... In your letter, explain the situation and why you believe the ticket was unfair. You'll get a letter immediately saying that your case is being reviewed. Later, you'll get a reply stating whether or not your appeal is accepted. The fine is put on hold as soon as the letter of appeal has been received. If the charge isn't dropped, then you have seven days to pay up or to make a further appeal. Okay. Thank you for your help. Okay. Good luck. 
Okay, so what is the student trying to say? What, what can be inferred about the student? She didn't know he was partying illegally. 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 Okay, mm -hmm. he eight. didn't know? Yes. Let it eat. Let it eat. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, good, good. Here, listen, we answered number five and six. Number five okay. and six. Listen again to part of the conversation, then answer the question. Well, when a vehicle has to be towed, the owner must pay for the towing and storage fees before the car can be taken. And I'm sorry to say, there's also a parking fine. What does the officer mean when she says this? And I'm sorry to say. A, B, C, or D. B. B. Me, she's apologizing for the towing. Which one, Miguel? Letter A. Letter, Letter A. a. Okay. Letter a. All right. Yes, maybe there A. Okay. And the next one, the next one. There's the students six. will? Mm -hmm. uh, letter A or B? Uh-huh, letter A. No, B, no, B, no. Okay, if I write a letter, it's your B. Request a handicap sticker. No. Oh, letter oh, A. Request a handicap sticker. Write a letter of appeal. Okay, all right. And the last one. Here I'm is our last Bonita. exercise. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've outlined a number of techniques for effective decision making. Uh, now let's focus on one approach to figuring out how to uh, make good business decisions. Okay, so. Uh, one way of deciding whether to go ahead with some new investment project is to perform what's known as CBA, or cost-benefit analysis. CBA can estimate and total up the money values of both the benefits and costs to a community, institution, or business to establish whether an investment choice is worthwhile. So let's assume you've generated solutions to a business problem and have thought really carefully about which way to go. You think you have the best solution available, but before going ahead with any investment decision, what you need to do is add up the value of the benefits as well as the costs of this action. Now, uh, what I mean by costs and benefits here is always, it's, it's always expressed in monetary terms. So, um, we find out what the cost is in money terms and also what the benefits might be also in money terms. Uh, then we subtract the costs from the benefits and we can choose whether to go ahead or not. All right, in simple terms, costs tend to be what we spend on something. Um, say, for example, a new piece of machinery and, uh, and benefits are uh, what advantages, expressed in money units, we get over the lifetime of that machinery because of having purchased it as opposed to, well, not having it or having some alternative. Um, in, in such a case, we can figure out a fairly simple CBA just by looking at expenses and uh, then subtracting them from the savings brought about by uh, improved uh, the improvements of introducing the machinery that would include things like the savings met by not having to pay salaries to employees who previously did the work of the machine. We could add the fact that the machines make fewer mistakes, <laughs> we hope, than human employees, so there will be fewer rejected products. But on the other hand, we have to factor in the cost of running the machines. Uh, such as maybe the increased electricity bill, the cost of repairs, and, of course, the cost of training someone to operate the new equipment. So that much is pretty straightforward. But we also have to think about less tangible, less 
Visible costs and benefits. Cost-benefit analysis really only works if we are careful to add in all the costs and benefits. Uh, costs, especially, are sometimes hidden. For example, in, in paying for this new stuff, we're taking liquid money and spending it, right? So we're no longer paid interest from having that money in a bank or otherwise invested. Okay, so we have to subtract that loss from the benefit side. Then, suppose also that the new machines are noisy. That means soundproofing, that's a cost. Or, or will it take up more space than the replaced workers and therefore require an addition to the building? These are less obvious costs, but they should be factored in to get an accurate picture. When we do CBA in a more public domain, uh, say on the building of a new road, the calculations can become even more tricky. Although there is some impressive software nowadays that helps us out, of course. So, how do we measure the benefits here? Does the road improve or worsen people's lives? A new road may, for example, uh, damage some wildlife habitat or some residential community may be inconvenienced by the noise or air pollution. On the other hand, the new road could improve property values by decreasing commuting times. Um, it could also save human lives since it's safer than the old road. In practice, CBA tries to put a value on all these things, although a lot of people may not like what it says. What it does is try to find out how people really value these apparently subjective things by looking at the financial choices they're prepared to make to gain a benefit or to avoid something on the cost side. In this way, we can put a monetary figure on all benefits and costs. Of course, these calculations can be complex and sometimes controversial, but I want to point out that CBA is a powerful tool and perhaps the most rational way of choosing whether to go ahead with a complex investment decision. Woo! The last one, difficult, right? Yes. Well, we have the answer. We have the answer. What's the answer? Uh, letter B. Uh -huh. To help explain how costs and benefits that work out. Letter or, D. Or the emphasis on financial side of business decision. B. Letter B. B. Okay. B. Yeah. For me, it's B. Yes? Yes, for me, it's B. Okay. Miguel? Miguel? B. Okay, okay. Let's take a look. Letter B. Woo! Perfect, perfect. Mm. Now the others. Now the others. <laughs> Number six. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. Number five. Letter oh. B. Letter yes. B. Emphasizing with the certain situation. Mm -hmm. Emphasizing mm -hmm. with the student situation. Yes. Understanding the student. Mm -hmm. Number oh, four, no. he drives to <laughs> campus. No, yeah. he was working illegally. He was, uh huh. He, he drives, drives to campus. campus. Mm -hmm. At the beginning, it says, said, uh -huh. yes, exactly. Exactly. Number three, yes. Number three is correct. Mm -hmm. Also, look at that. Number two, um, the more difficult was correct. A and, a and C. And number one, no. Number one is C. Uh, often use it. Is good. Circumstantial is good because people believe it. They mm -hmm. put the information together. Okay. Okay. All right, guys. Oof. So difficult <laughs> today, but don't worry. Tomorrow we continue. The idea is we finish the exercise on time. Yes? Okay. Yes. All right, nice. guys. Thank you guys so Excellent. much. Excellent. Have a nice night. Okay. Have a nice night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.